So as a landscape architect, I'm really interested in how the built environment impacts who we are and how we behave and how we act. And the Italians at, from the Renaissance actually gave us some really good uh, examples of um, this kind of design and, and this kind of interpretation of the landscape to, to help us appreciate how people act and uh, um, there we go how we uh, how we interact and how to how to embody a lifestyle within a built place and so uh, I first wanted to just talk about what is la dolce vita dolce vita literally translated it means the sweet life dolce means sweet uh, everybody likes sweets obviously we have a, a big table full of them back there that we've been enjoying um, but what it really means is living one moment at a time. It's, it's living in the moment and appreciating each moment for what it is and what it offers us. Now, of course, part of La Dolce Vita is the fact that we love, you know, these, uh, these, these elements of Italian culture and cuisine. Of course, we have gelato, cappuccino, and gnocchi. Um, but one of the things that makes Italian... The, the, the Italian concept of La Dolce Vita is so wonderful is the fact that it's very simple. It's not overly complicated. It doesn't have lots of bells and whistles to it. It's, it's about taking the essence of things and, 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 and embracing the essence. And that's what I want to talk about today. So part of La Dolce Vita and, and part of this duality in Italian culture is the fact that we have the vitality of these cities and they're busy, and they're close, and there's magnificent architecture, and it's dirty, and it's crowded, and it's noisy, and you get your pocket picked, and all these other kinds of things, right? And then, so that was a problem for these for these wealthy patricians as well. They 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 really struggled with, well, sometimes my safety is at danger, or I don't have a place to stay. I don't know about you all, but when I'm needing to really get some intellectual work done, I does not do me any good to sit in the middle of a piazza in Florence and, and, and try and do that work. That doesn't, there's too many distractions. And so what these, 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 these people did is they, they took that and they, they went outside of the city and they built villas where they could retreat. Sometimes it was for personal safety. Sometimes it was to just get out of the bustle and the, and the business and just kind of breathe. Sometimes it was a place as a as kind of a, a refuge from the dirt and the grime and everything. And so you have this peace and this contemplation that exists. This is Villa Medici, which is just outside of Florence, up in the hills of Fiesole. And um, this was built by the Medici to by Lorenzo the Magnificent as a place to just get away. Okay, and that's what this is really talking about is this kind of this juxtaposition of vitality with contemplation. Okay, so we have six locations and, and actually what I what I decided to do and I hope this is all right with you all is I would like for you to tell me what you would like to talk about today. We don't have to talk about all six and um, in uh, uh, in an effort to be fully transparent with you, I actually have an exam to give to my third and second year students at 11 o'clock in Northern Plains Biostress. So um, I'm going to be running because it's a real good exam and I don't want to have them miss it. Um, I spent a lot of time on this. So, but I, I would just like to know from you and, and, and we'll, we'll do as many of these as we can. Um, what would you like to talk about today? Anybody like to, to volunteer one? got six that you can choose from. Villa d'Este and Tivoli. Villa d'Este and Tivoli, okay. So Villa d'Este is just outside of Rome. It's about 20 miles from Rome in Tivoli, which is a tiny little town up on a hilltop, okay? And something that you need to know about Italy is that everything is very hilly. There's uh the, the, I think the most constant thing in Italy is the fact that the topography is always changing. And um, that's really a wonderful thing for a designer such as myself, because that makes it interesting to design. And you get to do a lot of different things with that, with that topography. Um, for building in the uh, 
building in the Renaissance, one of the great things was they didn't have electricity. And so for a place like Villa d'Este, they wanted a lot of water and they wanted a lot of water features and things that were, the water was doing all kinds of things. And so all they had was gravity. And so they used the topography of the site and that gravity to, to create the pressure, to create the different fountains and everything that we're going to, that I'm going to show you today. So Villa d'Este, some primary features for you. And this is a nice uh, kind of a pencil drawing for you. Uh, it has over 50 fountains of differing kinds and shapes and, and everything. I think if I was to count every uh, aperture that, that, that kind of jets water or, or throws water, we'd be well over 300, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe 500. Um, there's just water everywhere. And that's the main theme of this garden is water. Um, they also use this concept of a bar view. And I'm, I apologize to the people on Zoom. I'm actually gonna come over to the screen for just a minute. But so we have these strong axes, right? That, that, that are developed here. This is the building up here at the top, okay? And so as you come out, there's this, this long sight line here with fountain and fountain. And this is kind of a terminal point here that is kind of a destination visually, okay? But then what was more important is actually what you saw after that. It's that bar review, it's the backdrop that, that's being used. And, and you're saying, oh, wow, what a lovely setting. And it's not that you own the view, you're just using it. And so it was very careful. That's why people build their houses on hilltops now is because you want an unobstructed view over the valley, right? If you live somewhere that has topography more than 15 feet. Um, they also develop these views here so that th there's actually a view right here at the end of this of this axis here um, that, that looks out over the uh, over the valley this other direction. So you've got views this way, you've got views this way. And then when they didn't have good views, a uh, panoramic views, they actually terminated those in other forms. Um, of, of, of visual interest points to say, oh, well, let's just have something else here instead of a blank hillside or the neighbor's house or, or things like that. So another thing that the, the, that the Italians are really well known for is this concept of geometric plantings. Everything's gridded. It's all, there's a lot of strong reliance on symmetry uh, in the planting design. And then uh, something that's enjoyable about that is as you've got these sight lines, you've got these terraces, you know, stepping down, you've got places where you can surprise your guests because if you're going to spend all of this money, you better have some impact, right? And that's what they liked is having impact and surprising their guests. So their guests would go away talking about it, going, oh, isn't that wonderful that the Cardinal did this for us and, and all those kinds of things. So for example, here is one of the fountains, and this is actually a series of fountains, okay? So in the, the foreground, you see, oops, sorry. In the foreground, you see some, some still water, okay? It's just a pool. It's there to reflect everything else that's happening. So that as you're standing at one edge of the pool, you see the fountain in front of you, and you see the fountain at your feet it reflected, okay? It's that, again, bang for the buck. You want to have that impact. Then as you look up, You've got fountains and fountains and fountains. And at the, very, at the very top, at the very back of the screen there, that's actually a water-powered organ, okay? And uh, I have a video, um, it's not in this PowerPoint, but it's it's of that organ working. It doesn't, it's not working the same way now because we have electricity and they've remodeled it, unfortunately. But the principle was that it, there was a, mecha a mechanism behind that, that as the water flowed over the mechanism, it turned a gear that then played a song on this organ. And so it was perfectly hands-free, right? It was the first hands-free tech that we probably had. And um, it was just this kind of surprise. And it plays three times a day now at 11, 3, and I think 7 p.m. Um, and so if you're there at the right time, it's packed and Everybody's taking videos with their phones and it's a lot of fun. But you can, again, notice to the, to the right of the fountains, you've got this big hillside, right? And that's part of that terracing process that's happening. And this is what is made from, to, to make that terrace. This is a wall, okay, built up with hedges so you, you can't see the wall itself. And then, again, there's all of these fountains that are just 
spraying water. Keeping in mind that the, the climate in Rome is very hot and humid. Okay, and so the water is there to actually serve to cool things down as well as create some good sound. So you're, you're screening people's conversations. And it's just a lot of fun to see this. It's a surprise. You don't expect to see this much water shooting and spraying and spouting and everything else that it does. Okay, and then here's one of the borrowed views. So this is off the end of, the, of it looking from the house. This is what you would see. Okay, and it's actually quite attractive. You've got the church steeple there. You've got the little town. It's very picturesque. The tree is placed strategically, so it screens off a little bit less of a desirable view on one side. All right, so framing that view is very important for the success of this design. All right, and it's, it's those, those strategic decisions to get the maximum impact. Okay, that's what Villa Deste is all about. Okay, here's, here's an example of the ramp. This is called a scissor ramp, okay, because there's two um, kind of arms to it and they like open up like a, a scissors. In Italian, that's forbici, okay? And so you come down one side and then you come over or you can go down, all right? So this is relatively level in the middle and then it's either up or down here and up or down over there, okay? Any questions about Villa d'Este? What time of year was this? This was in May. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always go in May um, because it's too hot in August and that's when everybody's gone. That's when the national holiday is in, in Italy, the whole month of May or August, everybody's gone. Um, and I like to go right as soon as my contract is up here on <laughs> campus um, with my students. So that way they can get to jobs and things like that over the summer. So I always go in May and I'm there for three weeks, typically. Um, were they there when it was first built, or is this something that's developed over? Oh, that was built in the 16th century. And the water somehow circulates. It's called gravity. Yep. Yep. Gravity goes down. Huh? Correct. So they they actually ha have the gravity. They had a they diverted a river, okay, to power all of this. So that was the that was the source of water. It was a river that flowed into a canal then led here so they didn't have to get it back to the top they just kept the water coming yeah other questions these are great questions by the way thank you how about the, the building itself on the other side of it what is there a plaza and then town okay. uh, so if i come back up here one more so here's the here's this is the villa down here at the bottom okay you can see right, this is that, that water organ, okay? So, and then <laughs> here's a plaza, and then it's just town all around it. So. Other questions? So what's designed first, the town or the plaza? Well, what do you think? If you were rich and famous and had control, what would you design first? Yeah, you do the plaza, yeah. You say, I'm going to hold this off. I'm going to keep it separate and then let the town do what it will after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, in the back. The people who built the family of building, how did they get their money? That's a great question. How did they get their money? Well, uh, it, it, <laughs> he was a cardinal. And so in that time, um, when you became a cardinal, you got a lot of money for that. Uh, you paid in, of course, and then you, you, you got out. And, and uh, so he was actually given that whole city as, as his personal domain. And so the product of the city was his and anything that he was able to make a profit on from the, the serfs, the peasants that, that worked in that city, that was his. So, yeah. Is his his uh, descendants? So he, did. he wasn't a very good cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very different time. Yeah. <laughs> Monica, please. No, it is not. It's actually uh, owned and managed now by the state of Rome or the the, the Beni Culturali. It's the it's the kind of the the museum arm of 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 the of the province of Rome, and, and so they they run it. 
and uh, and keep it up and everything, and they they collect the fees. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh, gee, what was this? Twenty-two euros, I think. Sixteen euros. I don't remember exactly. About twenty bucks. Uh huh. Just to comment, um, if someone's going there, that Hadrian's villa is near here too. It right? sure is. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, Emperor Hadrian and and his pleasure park. Yep. Or the what's left of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh. So there's uh, Tivoli, and then down the hill is Villa Adriana, which is which is Hadrian's villa. And so yeah, it's a train stop before this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and jump back to our map. All right. Torino? Torino, would you like to do Torino? I would love to do Torino. Okay. So this is the Regia di Veneria, okay, outside of Torino. Uh, it's just six miles from Turin. And now something important to note about Torino. Torino at this time was part of the French Republic or French Empire. Okay, the Savoy, who were the uh, kind of the, the, the rulers here, were vassal, uh, it was a vassal kingdom to the kingdom of France, all right? So as a result of that, a lot of this borrows from French inspiration rather than Italian inspiration in terms of its design and its layout and the thinking behind it. Um, this was built shortly after Versailles was built, okay, and... Um, Versailles, of course, was the model for if you were going to have something nice, you're, you're going to build it after the pattern of Versailles because King Louis had all the money and all the power and all the fame, and he was the tippy top. And so everybody wanted to mimic him, right? And they'll say that something like mimicry is the best form of flattery, something mm -hmm. like that. All right, so this is a lot bigger, okay? Um, Villa d'Este was, what, 20 acres, something like that. This is 240 acres. It is enormous. And it's built, uh, so to Torino is in the Piemonte, right? It's at the foothills of the Alps. The Alps are the natural barrier between Italy and France on this side. Um, and I apologize, I don't actually have a really nice pencil drawing for you on this one, but some primary focus here. Instead of moving water like Villa d'Este, we focus on still water. It's 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 for reflecting. And the, one of the reasons for this is because we have the Alps, okay? And you want to reflect the Alps because they're magnificent. There's also a lot of sub gardens. So there's a there's a main axis, and then there's there's these kind of to the side. I mean, they're not really small. They're probably 20 acres each. But, um, you know, they, they have distinct uses. There's a rose garden, there's a vegetable garden, there's an herb garden, uh, there's an element garden, right, where you get your kitchen foods, uh, things like that. Um, these long views that are, you want it to disappear into the distance because you want to, it's a projection of your power. And you, what you're trying to say is, well, I'm powerful. Look, we will go into infinity. We'll go in, endlessly into the future. Okay, still the borrowed views, but like Versailles, this was a place to see and be seen. Okay, lots of court intrigue, lots of, hey, let's get together with our buddies and see who can dress in the most sequins and the most expensive dress or the most, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. It was all, I call it pageantry, maybe I call it puppetry, I don't know, but um that's that's what this is about. So, for example, this is this is the grand hallway in the palace. Okay, very similar to Versailles, except in Versailles, this would have been lined with mirrors, and here it's actually windows that that look out onto the garden. Because how can you beat the view? It's amazing. Okay, so there's no need to be inside. At Versailles, there's nothing around of interest. There's a big forest, there's, and then there's town, and that's it. So they wanted to close out the outside. Here, they wanted to bring the outside in. And the entire city of Veneria was built to support the palace, just like the city of Versailles was built to support the palace of Versailles. Okay, again, the, that duality there. So here is, and, and this is undergoing renovation, all right, after the fall of the French Empire and the, and the, the Kingdom of France in, in the early 19th century. 
um, Napoleon rose, right? And military power became all important. This was actually used as a barracks after the royal family was deposed. And so it went through a, a long period of degradation and they're still restoring it today. Okay, so what you see in the foreground is actually a fountain uh, that they're still working on restoring. You can see the outlets here of the water that would go out to actually feed these different elements in the landscape. And this is kind of the central basin, all right? So again, this, this long reflecting pool, all right? This is actually downhill, that's uphill, okay? So the back is higher than the front. And again, that's because you want that extension into infinity. If you're, if you're looking down and everything's going downhill and downhill, you can see the end. If it's going uphill, it's harder to see the end. Okay, again, that psychology of, of how you design and what you design for. And then, of course, the Maritime Alps in the background. Okay. All right. This is looking back the other way. So we finally got to the end of that long canal. We're looking back. So the palace is right here. Okay. And then you can see on either side, they're, they're working on restoring some of the bosques and the alleys. Uh, which are very important. A bosque is, is basically a, a grove of trees, but laid out in a geometrical fashion. An LA is a, is a pathway that's lined with trees. Okay, so again, it, it strengthens that long linear, and, and both of those are French terms, okay, bosque and, and LA. Okay, so here, and then here's a picture of, uh, of one of the gardens. This is a rose garden, of course, they brought in the trellis, that's new. Um, but that would have all been a part of this garden originally. Okay, what questions do you have about La Regia di Veneria? <coughs> yes, please. Absolutely. In fact, last so I was there this last May, and um, the Po, which is the main river that goes across uh, the north of Italy, was actually really low. And so, yeah, they're they're fighting drought in Italy just as much as we're fighting it here. And yeah, a lot of this cultural heritage, um, they're making they're having to make priorities. Do we keep the basin full, or do we? take care of the people that are dependent on the water you know is it about agriculture or is it about culture and that's i think that's a constant fight that we have to that we have and a discussion that we're having across the world as, as water scarcity becomes more of an issue uh, but yeah absolutely there's there there are some very difficult decisions that way mm -hmm. when they restored that area that was used as barracks um what will be there so that, that will be a fountain or a, a pool. So, and, and ideally what that's gonna be is a, is a larger reflecting pool with a spouting fountain in the center of it that will then lead you visually down to the next, to that Grand Canal. Great question. Other questions about, uh, about this garden? Yes, please. There are still some Savoy uh, today. Um, no, no, it was taken over by the state, by the people, um, and uh, they were deposed. They were sent into exile. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, the last remaining Savoy lives in Switzerland today. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> Of the city of Trino. This is just six miles. In fact, uh, they they built they re they rebuilt Turin in the seventh, 17th century, so that there was a uh, a straight line between their palace in downtown Torino and this palace here, and then there that was similar in to other palaces that they had in the area, and so Torino itself is actually based on those those those. Um, those processional pathways, yeah. And then there's a there's a regular French grid over the top of that. It's a fascinating study in urbanism. Yeah. Please. What kind of underground waterways are there? 
infrastructure? I don't know. Um, I'm certain that there's an awful lot of piping, similar to what's at Versailles. There'd be, uh, there would have been at that time clay piping um, that would have been probably two to three feet in diameter to carry that volume of water. Um, and then just kind of distributing that. And yeah, it would have been significant. And I know that they've been updating a lot of that, but I haven't, you know, I'm not going to go ask them if I can go in their pipes. That's... <laughs> you get really dirty. Okay. All right. Where would you like to go next? Take it to your favorite. Oh, we already went to my favorite. <laughs> Villa Garzoni. Okay. Colodi uh, is a town that's actually been, it, it didn't used to be called Colodi. It was named after Colodi, who wrote Pinocchio. He grew up in this town here. Um, and so this is, we, I call it Pinocchio town because there's a theme park just off, just around the corner from here. Um, this is, so this is in the region of Toscana, Tuscany. Um, it's, like it says here, about 40 miles from Florence. It's in Pescia is the old, old name of the town. Um, the, the villa is about four acres in size, so it's not a huge expansive one. Uh, we're getting back down to that more typical Renaissance Italian uh, kind of thought process. And as you can see here, um, what we've got are, is a lot of reliance on symmetry, okay? A lot of symmetry. We're talking about land, about plants as art and, and laid out to be looked at uh, both from the ground view, but also from above. So that when you're in the house and everything, you can look out and see um, the tracery that's happening. Okay. So again, it's, it's terraced onto the hillside. Again, um, Tuscany, of course, has got uh, the big ridge of the Apennines going through it. Uh, the rigid symmetry the large gathering at the bottom terrace, and that's that's designed for entry and for entertaining and things like that. They'd have huge parties here. And then interconnected fountains that lead to that bottom terrace. And of course, the 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 uh, the tracery of the of the geometric planting design. So let me just show you what we've got going on here. This is looking from the bottom, looking up. Okay. And so you start down here with the light pole and everything. You're looking uphill all right and um so you've got you've got some grottos and caves you've got again those those kind of scissor stairs is what the you know that that same principle as the ramp but they're stairs um that way you can get up hill faster this is a very steep site um and then these are just some elements of how the the planting design and and the water feature this is some details for you sometimes it's nice to see the details Okay, so here's looking back down. We're about two thirds of the way up. There's still quite a bit behind us, um, but we're looking now down to that bottom terrace so that you can see the interconnectedness of the water that's, that's happening here, All right? So the water comes down in a, in a kind of a canal, but it's pretty steep. It comes, it hits this fountain that powers that, that fountain that's, that you're seeing in the foreground, these little drops right in here, okay? And then it continues down. There's some water play elements that happen on the next terrace, and then it come, hits again and again, okay? Now, I have to admit, I was here, this was 2014, this photograph. Uh, when I took this picture and was at this villa, I was not planning on this presentation, so I apologize. I don't have a lot of great photos of this, of this particular environment, but uh, I'm doing my best to show you what I can, okay? Here's a group of my students. They were very happy they got back to the bottom because um, it was quite a walk. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular garden, and this is actually similar to the Boboli Garden in uh, Florence, which was kind of the, the main palace of the Medici family on the other side of the Arno River, um, is that up on the side, you see, you know, if you come up and then you look, there's a bunch of trees on either side of that, that central axis. 
those trees actually conceal some other little avenues that go by and they're hidden. And um, okay, we're all mature here. Those were places where, where people would go and have little trysts. Um, <laughs> kind of the kissing wall if you will uh they go in there and they you know have their romances and and everything and uh that's also that's very similar that's what this is showing you here so you can see out you can tell if someone's coming you know so you can scurry into another one if you need to or whatever but uh you're hidden away you're tucked away and and it's like hang putting the hanger on the dorm room door right you just <laughs> we're in here um leave us alone um the bamboo is actually used, and that bamboo grows naturally here. The bamboo is used because it creates a barrier, but it's a very thin barrier, so you still have those opportunities to view out if you need to, okay? So just an interesting feature that's put into this garden that's a little bit different from some of the others we're talking about today. So when does this restructured these uh these are um these are restored original so uh probably the s mid 1700s mm -hmm. yeah other questions yeah please with all the greenery especially here how often does that have to be replaced i mean obviously the trees probably aren't 200 years old. I mean, there's got to be some type of architectural design to replace that, right? So there's a, there's ongoing maintenance with these with these villas uh, to either try and and maintain uh, the the canopy, maintain the forest, maintain the the, the landscaping. Um, but you know, a lot of it they just a lot of naturalize. It's a very different management strategy in Italy than what we have in the United States. Uh, we they don't mow lawns very often. That's just not something that. It is highly valued there. Um, parks are often not perfect, immaculate lawns like we would expect. It's kind of spotty and patchy, and what it is is what it is, and that's fine. Uh, it's very Italian. Um, and so a lot of this is just naturalized. They just say, okay, well, let's plant the kind of the essence of what we're looking for, and in 15 years, it's what we like and and then it's just a matter of you know well okay maybe we need to come in here and hack these out a little bit or plant a couple more or, or things like that but it's really kind of left to itself i would say probably once every 100 years or so they have to come in and really do a, a deep clean which in italy that's nothing you know that's once a lifetime so yeah. other questions is there any overhead structure? Nope, it's open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the overhead structure that you get are actually these vines that come kind of kind of come across. Mm -hmm. So it's a very pervious uh, structure. It's 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 sort of open to air, but you've got the greenery and everything, and so it, it kind of creates this beautiful green light that you're seeing here, um, just kind of filtering all that sunlight. It's again it. You can imagine how this would be more of an intimate space, um, which is probably why they used it the way they did. <laughs> okay. All right. We have 15 minutes left before I need to go. So we've got three of them done. Where would you like to go next? Would you like to go near to Venice? Would you like to go back yeah. down near Rome? Or would you like to go to Florence? Venice. Venice. Okay. Let's go to Venice. Okay, Villa Pisani. In Venice, we had the Republic of Venice, okay? The uh, the Serene Republic, the Serenissima. And uh, they had an elected doge, is what he was called. You've probably, if you've been to Venice, you've probably been to the doge's palace in downtown Venice, uh, right off of St. Mark's Square. Um, at one point, the Pisani... Um, Alvise Pisani became the doge. And of course, becoming the doge doesn't mean that you get lots of money. It means that you give lots of money because you have to pay off everybody who elected you. Um, it's very Italian, right? So as part of that, he he already had this, this little estate outside of Venice. Um, he actually, they got here by boat. They didn't go in their carriage usually, they went by boat. Again, it's Venice, right? So we're thinking about water. 
And um, he already had this place. And he said, after he became Doje, well, <laughs> now that I'm Doje, we better uh, build this up. Unfortunately, he wasn't Doje very long. And um, it bankrupted him to be Doje. And so the, the villa never got completely realized the way that he wanted it to be. Um, and so we're kind of left with it uh, a little bit unfinished still. Interesting thing about Vila, uh, Vila Pisani is that um, Napoleon took this over as one of his royal residences. So there's actually Napoleon's bedchamber still there. You can see the short little bed. I mean, <laughs> Napoleon was what this tall, right? So uh, the bed, the you know, the bed is maybe five feet long. Uh, and and another reason for that is because in that day they actually didn't sleep fully flat. They slept sitting up and so you didn't need as much of a bed because you were sitting sitting to sleep and you just were surrounded by pillows and that kind of a thing um another interesting thing is uh prior to world war ii adolf hitler met with benito mussolini here at villa pisani to sign their accord that the allied italy and germany as the axis powers so this has a very interesting history in fact the, the that long um trench of, of water that you see going into there they actually use that for submarine testing uh it, in prior to world war ii they were building they were testing the concept of many submarines and they would test them in here to make sure that they worked properly before they deployed them fascinating right who knew that we had that kind of a heritage in, in some of these villas i think alvise would have been like oh that was interesting. Okay. So uh, there's a focus here on, on still and reflective water. This was a garden designed to be viewed from the house. He wanted to see everything that was going on. Okay. And so he designed it so that it was viewed from the house. And in fact, so if you like tapestries and frescoes and things like that, this, uh, the house, which I'm not going to show you the inside of, uh, the grand ballroom was actually, the ceiling was painted by uh, Tiepolo. Um, and it's one of his masterpieces. And so if, uh, if for no other reason, you should go to Villa Pisani so that you can see Tiepolo's ceiling there. Um, Tiepolo was regarded as one of the foremost uh, fresco painters in uh, the northeastern part of Italy uh, in his day. There's also a maze with a tower in the center that I want to show you. It's a strong axial layout. There's side gardens for privacy. Again, those trysts and things. Uh, and for food, uh, they had a, 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 they were trying to be self-sustaining. And then um, additional buildings were put into the landscape for fun and for different functions uh, alternatively. So there's the building. So if this is looking backward from the end of it, of the canal back toward the, the palace. So the grand ballroom is here, this whole thing here, okay? And so the ceiling is here, that, that fresco ceiling by Tiepolo is right here. And again, you're, it's designed so you can stand on these balconies and look out and see everybody else and what they're doing. And uh, Alvise uh, Pisani was all about power, an obvious power. Okay, he wanted everyone to know who was boss. Okay, this is called an excedra. An excedra is a structure that is designated, it's a node. Okay, so if you have several pathways coming, to, then they intersect. You put the excedra at that intersection, and it's a place where people gather. Okay, an intersection of pathways is a natural gathering point already. So by placing the excedra there, you've got additional interests of reasons for people to come at the base there are there are benches and things where people can sit they're built into the etc and then there's also stairways inside each of those those uh um columns here that leads you up to the top so that you can kind of take a look around and see what's going on it's designed for fun it has no other purpose than to create a visual accent and a, and a focal point in the landscape Okay, and in the center of the etc., it's actually open. There's a circular opening so you can look up and people can look down and you can drop water balloons on them or whatever else you want to do. All right, this is the maze. This is a, it's a right-handed maze in case you ever go there. Um, it's very hot. Those, those shrubs, you can see this is actually a person's head. 
Okay, so the shrubs are five, six feet tall because they don't want you to see how to get out, I guess. <laughs> so it's a right-handed maze. So if you keep your right hand on the wall all the time and you just follow it around, you'll get to the center. Then you get out, you just put your left hand on the wall and you, you follow it to get out. Um, one of the interesting things now is they actually have a, a full-time staff person on the tower who will scream out instructions if you get lost. Turn to the left! And uh, she comes in handy. It actually gets so hot in there that they close it between 11 and 2 p.m. or 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. because it it's so hot that people faint in the maze and, and that becomes dangerous. So they don't let anybody in there for those few hours of the day. Um, part of this was for fun, right? And there's a destination in the middle. There's a tower that you can go up into and, and on top of. And so it, there's, a, there's a reason for going in there, but it's fun and it's exciting, but it's also contemplative. People used labyrinths and labyrinthine um, you know, paving patterns and, and, and planting patterns and things like that, because it was a, it was a chance to focus on something mechanical that allowed your brain to kind of wander free and, and do what it needed to do so that you could recharge. So it was actually meant to be contemplative in nature uh, that way. Uh, today, we actually call that a process of, of mental restoration. Uh, is what that's called. Um, we, we're recovering from mental fatigue, which is just the the pain of doing intellectual and mental work. Uh, and we need to, you, pro, you guys have probably all, all suffered from that at one point or other, just the, oh my goodness, my head is just so full. I need to just kind of break free. And this is a place that in the Renaissance, they would do that, okay? All right, so this is looking down from, now we're looking from the house out. At the back there, those are actually stables. <laughs> Right, I know. And uh, yeah, that was stables and they also had a small uh, um, a soldiery. There, there were some soldiers that were stationed there to protect the, the doje when he was going out and about, and, you know, kind of your own personal police force. Um, so lots of fun. Okay, are there any questions about Villa Pisani? Wow. Okay. All right, I don't think that I'm gonna have time, I apologize, to talk about the other two. I'll just run you through a couple of the, uh, the highlights real fast. So Villa Gambaraya is in Settignano. This is just outside of Florence. It's not the same as the one I showed you uh, uh, earlier. Um, this one is just a private residence out in the, in the Tuscan Hills, okay? It's a focus on the still reflective water, the borrowed views. Um, and, and side gardens there. So this is what it looks like from the house looking out, okay? Um, very geometrical layout and everything. Um, this is a grotto. Um, they would kind of go and this was more of a private space rather than a, a, a more family space. Okay, very simple. That's, that's something to take home from this one. It's very simple and uh, very still water. So they'd have lotus and other, other forms of aquatic flowers in here to break up that water. But it's, it's just, it's very quiet, very peaceful. It's surrounded by a vineyard uh, and, and olive trees um, and absolutely breathtaking. And then finally, Villa Lante. This is about 50 miles north of Rome. That's up by Viterbo. And uh, we're actually, the whole, the whole site is, is this. <laughs> the main garden is actually right here, okay? So maybe about four acres of the 40 is, is the, the, the primary garden. This was another one of those cardinals that wasn't so good sometimes, um, had lots of money. And so he designed this. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about this, it used to be called Villa Gambaro. And, that was because it was Cardinal Gambaro. Gambaro means lobster, okay? And so I'm going to show you, there's actually a lot of lobster motif throughout all this thing. It's kind of a play on his name. Um, so this is, this is called the Fountain of the Moors. It's at the lowest point. Again, you need all that water pressure that was built up from the hillside to come down and, and to power this thing, okay? Um, that's looking at it from up above now. 
And then this is looking at it from, this is that same, that's this. Now, if I turn around, I see this, okay? And so um, you can see right here in the middle, kind of hard to see, but that is the crayfish, okay? And this, this big stone feature in the center, that was a dining table. The water was in there. They put their wine in there and it'd keep it chilled. <laughs> and so they'd have ready chilled wine anytime they wanted it. And, and they would just sit on either side of that dining table and, and eat their feast and drink their wine and probably have some real crazy parties. Um, okay. And then again, the brodery, um, that, that tracering uh, pattern of the, of the shrubs. This one is more of a Renaissance garden because it doesn't have a lot of color to it. It's very muted. It's monochromatic, right? It's greens and grays. Other gardens that, that kind of evolved after this were a lot more colorful. They had pinks and purples and blues and reds and other, other things that just kind of made it more lively. Okay. So... Those are, those are the six villas that I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Uh, does anyone have any last questions before I need to scoot? What Please. What class do we need to take to go to Italy? <laughs> I don't know if you want to go to Italy with me. Uh, typically, I do a walking tour of Italy, uh, and we walk about 250 miles in three weeks. How many weeks? 20. Oh, okay. oh, not a problem. Okay, uh, it's LA389. I, next time I offer it is, uh, is next May. I have to tell you, undergraduate students get first priority. <laughs> it's part of their major, but uh, I, I have had some adults come in the past. So, yeah. Are there gardens in the United States or Canada that built on these principles that would be ready, for example, in Monticello? Monticello is a very different place. Uh, Monticello decided or that was Jefferson's approach to Palladianism. So the architecture is very Palladian, which is Palladio was was an architect in the northeast of, of Italy. Um, but uh, the gardens, I would say probably not so much. Um, I'm trying to think of good Italianate gardens in, in America. And there's not a lot of them left anymore um a place you might go is biltmore that's in uh, north carolina that was designed by uh frederick law olmsted who was the the first landscape architect uh, for the for the vanderbilt family um and that's got some great examples of more french uh design but there there are traces of italian design um Maybe the Getty in Los Angeles would be another good place to look. Um, there's some there's some strong Italian features in the in the, in the Getty Museum. There's one in Milwaukee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and I apologize. I don't focus a lot on the traces of Italy in America. I mostly focus on the source material. So, I don't know the the the, the American versions very well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. only visit <laughs> that depends on what part what, what's the rest you want to see i mean are you if you're in rome i would say go to villa lante and and, and villa d'este if you're in florence i would say go to villa garzoni and villa gambaraya if you're in venice by all means i would i would take a day trip out to uh, padova and and visit i mean if you're going to go visit saint anthony's basilica right which is right there then this would be this is just five miles out of town on a bus. It's a simple bus ride. Uh, so it I guess I would say it depends on what you want to see. I didn't even put my favorites in here. I just put the ones in that exemplified the Italianate architectural style the best. Um, my favorite is actually up on Lago Maggiore, right up here. Um, and, and it was built by an English sea captain in, uh, in the, the 1900s, so the 20th century. Um, that's one of my favorite favorite places. It's called Villa Taranto. Perhaps you can come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much. Appreciate your time today.
And uh, yeah. Thank you very much. We just have a little toll oh. of our appreciation for Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Come back. I appreciate that. And, and for those of you that skipped my wife's uh, aerobics class this morning to come here, I'm going to hear about it this evening. So you better make it up to her. So.